I would say the one that surprises people a lot is whales and hippos. That's the one I get the most questions about. So we know they're close relatives from a couple of sources of data. The first one was um, molecular data that shows that they're closely related, that hippos are the most closely related living animal to whales. And then we found fossil evidence um, in um, Pakistan, where we've got early whales that very clearly share the same ankle joint as the artiodactyls, as the hippos and camels and pigs do. It's a very specific, very specialized bone. The um, astragalus bone has a very weird shape that's very distinctive. And when we found that, we, that, that finally convinced all the paleontologists that the molecules must be right. <laughs> highly, highly modified hoof mammals. They become carnivorous, but what's really interesting is that, so for example, baleen whales have actually kind of gone back to an artiodactyl way of eating. They're bulk feeding. They're just bulk feeding on protein instead of grass. They, yeah, they look kind of like squirrels, and they're really a fascinating group of mammals. Um, many people don't realize it, but they're around during the age of dinosaurs in the, in the Mesozoic, and they persist until the Eocene, so until Dinosaurs are long gone, we have the radiation of modern mammals, and they're still hanging on. They finally seem to get kind of beaten out by the rodents and the, and the rabbits, but they're tremendously diverse, incredibly long-lived. They were around longer than we've been around by a lot. Well, they seem to actually have quite a lot of dietary diversity. That's been some work that um, Ann Weil has done and Greg Wilson has done. Um, and right now, we're actually interested in looking at, um, I'm working with Ann Weil and Craig Scott, and we're, we're looking at what actually makes their teeth click, why, how they're different from therian mammal teeth, so from marsupials and, and placental mammals, because their, their dental morphology is quite different and quite unusual. And it, we've, we've started CT scanning the teeth and their structures are a little funky. The paleocene acine thermos, thermal maximum is a really intriguing period of time because Apart from today, it's the, one of the most rapid climatic changes we can track in the fossil record. It, we see uh, changes in mean annual temperatures of up to nine degrees over a period of 100,000 years. And it's a, so it's a period of what we think term runaway global warming. And essentially what seems to have happened is there's some indication of massive CO2 influx, so hugely comparable to modern day changes in climate. Um, that may have involved actually melting of m methane hydrates in the deep ocean, which releases a huge amount of greenhouse gas, right? And so you have this rapid greenhouse warming, and that affects mammals. Mammals are very sensitive to temperature changes, um, and so we actually see quite a lot of lineages of mammals getting much smaller. It's one of the neat things about, about the Paleocene Eocene and the Eocene in general is it's, it's considerably warmer than today and really, really warm. And so in the Middle Eocene, a little bit later, you actually get tropical flora, tropical forest, almost up to the Arctic Circle. So it's really different from today. There's a lot more trees. There's a lot more small um, frugivorous fruit-eating species, lots of monkeys, well, not modern monkeys, but lots of really primates. Um, lots of really small hoofed mammals, not like what you see today, rabbit-sized things, very, very different fauna. So the main hypothesis for what's causing the dwarfing is one that, that being the, it suddenly getting a lot warmer is putting a lot of pressure on the mammals and they're, they're responding by getting smaller, the lineages that are already there getting smaller. The other hypothesis is that no, the main driver was actually immigration of smaller species. So as things warm, species that were formerly restricted to further south move in northward. And we're seeing that now, right? You see, you hear reports of tuna being found in different oceans than they should. You're seeing a lot of movements of species, right? Into areas they had formerly been unable to occupy. And um, what, so the argument was that most of that change in body size was actually immigration of smaller animals. So what we're able to do with this mathematical approach to the price equation is to sort of partition out what is actually change in the mammals that were already there, what is immigration of small species, and a third component which is called species selection. And in that, what we're looking at is, does being bigger or smaller affect your rate of extinction when climate is getting warmer, or your rate of speciation? And what we're finding is that actually that component is acting in opposition to the other two components. So immigration and evolution in place are pushing mammals to be smaller at the PETM, but we're getting a counteracting effect from species selection. So 
species selection is actually favoring larger body sizes for species. One of my former advisors, Christine Janis, says that most people think of the present or the past as the present with extra dinosaurs. And what I really drives me is that the past is actually very fundamentally different from the present. The present is a very short and very weird time slice. Most people don't realize that what they look at out the window is actually really still recovering from a mass extinction and it's not what we should see. A normal North American Cenozoic fauna should have a saber-toothed carnivore and it should have an elephant and it should have camels and we're missing all those things. And so to me it's, it's really important to drive home that importance of history and understanding how we got to where we are and, and how we can change things going forward.